Good evening. How are you? It's nice to be with you tonight. I think we have uh, the slides coming, but uh, would you mind praying with me? It's mainly for my sake, but uh, if you don't mind, I, w I would appreciate if we could pray together. Father God, as we come into your presence tonight, we are asking that you would show us Jesus. Lord, please open our eyes to behold your glory. Please help our hearts to be melted in obedience to you. Not an obedience that simply comes because we ought to, out of obligation or out of fear, Lord, we ask that you would show us your glory. That our hearts may be subdued and, and just want to follow you because of how wonderful you are. So Lord, please help us tonight as we study your word to hear what you want to say to us. Please give us the promise of your spirit and help our hearts to be open and receptive to what you want us to hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of the message tonight is The God of the Desperate. And uh, I was listening to a Wall Street Journal report recently. And in the, in the report, they were talking about some research done at Princeton University. And they had a couple of sociologists who were doing some things, or actually I think they were economists that were doing some work. And, and as they were doing this work, they discovered something. They discovered in the United States that there were certain groups of people that actually their longevity was going down. Now that's not unusual in a third world country where you know, there's inadequate nutrition or there's just a lack of hospitals and stuff like that, but why here? Why in the United States would there be mortality lifespans actually going down? And as they were doing the research, they actually found that they call this, they call it the um, deaths of despair. And as they're talking about it, they say it's a warning sign for America. And here's what they said, two Princeton economists economists are sounding off what they consider to be a warning sign of a crisis in American capitalism. Professor Ann Case, a Nobel Prize winner, economist Angus Deaton, see increases in suicides and other deaths of despair, particularly among middle-aged white Americans, as a sign that something is not right with society. It's interesting to me because it was not just um, the Wall Street Journal that was reporting it. The Guardian had an article on it, too. It says, it is the, face, the US facing an epidemic of deaths of despair. So what's going on in our world? Why are people getting so desperate? And it's not just the world, per se. It's in the Christian world, too. Um, inspiration has a quote like this. Into the experience of all, there comes times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement, days when sorrow is the portion, and it's hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children, days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life, it is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providence, we would see angels seeking to save us from ourselves. So even Christians can go through experiences in their lives where it is just so hard so rough, the problems are coming so fast and they are so significant that there's almost a sense of what is the use? How do we deal with despair? How do we deal with discouragement? As Christians, we are not exempt to discouragement in case you haven't noticed that. We have situations in our lives that can bring us down too. So how can we deal with Christian, how can we deal with discouragement? Well, I want to talk about a couple ways and a couple people who have gone down this road already before us and look at some of the ways they dealt with discouragement. Here's one option way of dealing with discouragement, and that's just giving up and quitting. 
there are actually some advantages. I'm being facetious, but there are some advantages to quitting and giving up in life. Have you heard of this guy? This is Chris Hill Scott. Anybody heard of Chris? You know when you type in your computer and you start to type and then um, the computer finishes the word for you? Yeah, that was, this is Chris. He and three other guys or a couple other guys actually wrote th that software. They were from Cambridge and they wrote this, I forget the name of the company, what it was called, but they, they wrote that software and they were busy working on it, developing up this new firm and everything. But the days were long and it was hard. It was hard work to get this company off the ground. And finally, one day, Chris just decided, you know what, I've had enough. This is enough. Day's been too long. I am, I am out of here. And so he sold his shares in the company to the co-founders that were with him for a bicycle. Now, it was shortly after that that Microsoft bought the company for $250 million. Had Chris hung in there, Chris would have got somewhere between 25 to $50 million. But see, there's great advantages just to quitting, right? Chris doesn't have to worry about what to do with that 25 to $50 million today. He doesn't have to worry about how he's going to keep all of that in one bank account. He doesn't have to worry about anything. Right? Chris can just give up and miss out on all of that. Do you know this guy? Seen him before? He's in your home. I guess he's in your home. He's probably in your pockets, many of you. This is Ronald Wayne. He was the third co-founder of Apple, the Apple, <laughs> right? Apple company, along with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In fact, he was a little older than the other ones, and he was kind of considered the parent. He was supposed to be the business manager. In exchange for being the business manager, he would get 10% of the stock in Apple. But as time went on and days got rough and things got a little bit discouraging and desperate and he decided, you know what, I don't think I want to take the risk. Because Jobs was borrowing a little bit of money. He borrowed $15,000 to build some computers so he could sell them and everything. And Wayne thought, you know, hey, these guys, they don't have a lot and if we, we lose, I might lose some of that money that you know, I'm investing into this. So he took and he sold his 10% to other people for $800. $800. Do you know what that 10% would be today if he had kept it? $95 billion, not million, billion dollars. One list says that if he would have stuck it out, if he wouldn't have quit, if he wouldn't have given away to despair, he would be right now the third richest man in the world. But you know, there's advantages to quitting, right? To giving up, right? Because Ronald doesn't have to worry about where to put his Maserati tonight. He doesn't worry, have to worry about his Lamborghini. He doesn't have to worry about that million dollar home. He can just go home to his, you know, little whatever, dinky apartment because he gave up, right? Obviously, I'm being facetious. You know, there were uh, some people in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 6, and they were surrounded with problems. And the problems were so big and so heavy on their hearts that we're told that the, the siege in Samaria got so bad that people were actually like trying to sell a donkey's head for what looks like eight pieces of silver. I don't know about you, but donkey heads doesn't sound very appetizing to me. But that's how bad it was, right? And the king, who was kind of witnessing what his people were going through, came to the point after he heard what some of the women in the, what were eating for lunch that day, decided that, hey, this is ridiculous. I'm out of here. He would said, surely this calamity is for the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Right? And as he went to take Elijah's head off of him, or Elisha's head off of his body, right? Elisha said to him, he says, listen to the word of the Lord. The Lord says, tomorrow about this time, a basket of fine flour will be sold for one piece of silver in the gates of Samaria, and two baskets of barley will be sold for a piece of silver. And here's the point. When people cry out, what is the use of waiting for God anymore in my life? God cries out, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. 
I know right now that it seems bad, it seems desperate, you don't see a way out of it, but I do see a way out of it, and I'm going to take care of you. Well, how would God do it? You know, when you read the Bible, you see that God constantly raised up little saviors or little heroes to rescue his people when they got in trouble. So can you imagine the angels as they're watching this? There's this town that is in big trouble, right? And the people are probably, um, or the angels are probably wondering, okay, well, God is going to deliver them. We heard the prophecy. We heard all about it. Eli, you know, Elisha said tomorrow this time. So I wonder who God is going to use as the hero. I mean, is he going to raise up some kind of David? Is he going to take Elijah and, and arm him with a sling and send him out against those Syrians that are surrounding there? And that would be neat to see, to see Elijah go out there with a sling. and You know, that would be cool. But I think when they saw who God was going to choose for heroes, they gasped. It wasn't a David. It wasn't a Samson. It wasn't Elijah with a sling in his hand. But who God raised up for heroes, here they are. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said one to another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine's in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we will die also. Now, therefore, come and let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. To people who felt like the only choices left to them in life is to die, to be crushed by its burdens and sorrows, or to surrender to the enemy, or to be consumed by the people in the church. Can you imagine going to that church? You walk in, you say, hey, are you having a potluck today? And they say, yeah. Well, what are we having? You. Can you imagine being a part of a church where that, like that? To those people who felt like life had left them with no choices, any good choices left, but just burdens, to those people, God had hope and help. Those were the people who felt like there were no good choices left in life that God used in a powerful way. Watch the scripture. And they rose up at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. It seemed like all they had was lousy choices in life. Keep the status quo and die. Go into the city and be eaten or surrender and probably be killed. But there was a fourth choice. Attack. Notice in this verse, as they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, the Lord had caused the army of Syrians to hear the noise of chariots. Therefore, they arose and fled at what? When? Twilight. Are you getting the picture? The moment these guys got up, these lepers, these people who felt like they had no good choices left in life, the moment these people got up, God got up and went before them. As they rose up to surrender, God rose up to attack. They thought they were casualties of wars, victims of circumstances out of their control, but they were really the avant-garde. They were the Marines and the Navy SEALs. They were the advance wave leading the way to victory. Can you imagine this? I know this is, a little pre this is a little bit of my imagination, but can you imagine this? As they begin to get up and walk away from the gates of the city, they're lepers, they're staggering, right? And as they're doing this, maybe some angel was sitting there, right, with a recording, you know, he's just sitting there with a mic, and he's miking it. And there's another angel with a long speaker wire, and he's back there at the camp of the Syrians, and they're amplifying it back there in the camp of the Syrians as these guys are staggering along, and the Syrians are freaking out at this. You may feel like you are just stumbling around in the darkness tonight, barely getting by, but angels may be recording your fumbling efforts and playing them back in the enemy's camp. 
your enemies may at this very moment be saying, what is that sound? It is terrifying. Never give up. You don't know how God may be using at this very moment your feeble efforts to strike terror and bring victory to the cause of God. Never, never give up. You know this guy? Elijah the Tishbite. Now, he had some really difficult situations in his life. He had some desperate situations in his life. Perhaps you heard, you know, he had seen the fire of the Lord fall from heaven and consume the rocks and the sacrifice and the water. He had seen God when he prayed and God called down the rain, or the rain came running down, right? He had seen all that. He had seen amazing things. And that night he had run before um, the king all the way back to Jezreel. And as he settled into bed that night, he got a text message, right? From love, Jezebel, right? And what did Jezebel have to say to him? So Jezebel sent this message to Eliza. May the gods strike me and even kill me if this time tomorrow I have not killed you. To Elijah at that moment, it seemed like all his efforts were in vain. Three and a half years of eating bird food. Three and a half years of hanging out with nobody around. Three and a half years of living with this you know, this, in this other country, right? All of my efforts, all of my work, maybe something three and a half years, that's about a BS, isn't it, or a BA, right? All of my efforts, all of my work is in vain. Elijah may have thought, I have trusted God for nothing. What's the use? All this work, all this effort, and I got nothing. These people are still as wicked and dumb as ever, right? What should have Elijah told Jezebel? When Elijah heard that message, what should he have told the messenger? Inspiration tells us that Elijah should not have fled from his post of deity. He should have met the threats of Jezebel with an appeal for protection to the one who had commissioned him to vindicate the honor of Jehovah. He should have told the messenger that the God in whom he trusted would protect him against the hatred of the queen. You know, today we have the devil's messengers coming into our lives. Have you ever met any of those guys? Sometimes they come in the form of an unexpected bill. Sometimes they come in the form of a marriage problem, right? Sometimes they come in the form of problems with your kids or problems at your work, right? Problems with your family. And those messages come, the devil's messengers come, right? And they tell us that all our efforts are in vain. They scream at us that you have trusted God for nothing. Let us do what Elijah should have done. When Satan's messengers tell you the situation is going to destroy you, tell the messengers to deliver a message back to his boss for you. And here's the message. God will take care of me. When Satan's messengers tell you the situation is hopeless, that things will never change, that it's always going to be like this, you send a message back to him. Tell him that God is going to help you. When Ahab got home, back to Elijah. Elijah, notice what Elijah did when this happened. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. This is kind of ironic, right? What was the reason he ran? He was afraid he was going to die, right? And then he gets over there, and he's finally at the end of his running, and he says, Lord, I want to die. (laughs) I mean, it's just kind of strange, right? But desperation is like that. Notice, please, that 
One of the ways the devil works is the panic reflex. With Elijah, he made Elijah run. Run, Elijah. Get out of here. Take off, man. Remember when the demons went into the pigs? What did he do with them? He spooked the pigs so much that the pigs took off running and they ran down the hill and when they got to the cliff they were so panicked, so exasperated by life that they could not stop and they plunged into the lake and killed themselves. The devil has a panic button. Remember Israel when they were at the Red Sea and Pharaoh approached the people of Israel and they looked up and they what? They panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why didn't you make us leave Egypt? Didn't you, we tell you this would happen while we were there? We said, leave us alone. Let us be the slaves in the Egyptian. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. What are they doing? <coughs> They're panicking, like us. Or at least like some of us. But what was God's message to people like, that felt like life was out of control? The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Calm down. God will fight for you. In another place in Isaiah, it says this, <coughs> in quietness and in confidence, there you'll find strength. There you'll find strength to deal with the stuff that you're going through. <coughs> Excuse me. Rest in God. Don't feel that a severe taxing effort is required on your part. <coughs> all that God requires is simple trust to drop into his arms with all his weakness and brokenness and imperfection, and Jesus will help the helpless and strengthen and build up those who feel that they are very weakness itself. <coughs> God will be glorified in his affliction through the patience, faith, and submission exemplified by him. Oh, this will prove the power of truth we profess. It is a consolation when we need it. It is a support when every prop of earthly nature, which has been a measurable support, is removed. Did you notice there? When we feel so weak, that when we reach out and pull the Webster's Dictionary off the shelf and look up the word weakness, it says, look in the mirror. To people like that who feel like they are the definition of weakness, God says, I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will build you up. What do you think Elijah was expecting when he was running? What do you think he was expecting? Do you think he was expecting all things work together for good to those that love the Lord? I don't think so. Watch out for your expectations when you feel desperate. We tend to find what we are expecting. There's an effect in science called the Pygmalion effect. And it's really kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's really a, a fascinating area of uh, psychology. But uh, the Pygmalion effect goes something like this. Here's a couple examples of the Pygmalion effect. This is from the Harvard Business Review. The way managers treat their subordinates is subtly influenced by what they expect of them. If managers' expectations are high, productivity is likely to be excellent. If their expectations are low, productivity is likely to be poor. It is as though there was a law that caused subordinates' performance to rise or fall to meet managers' expectations. Isn't that incredible? That the success of the company was based on the expectations of the manager. 
And it just makes me wonder, you know, what are we expecting of one another? Are we expecting high things of one another? Here's another one. This one was a, kind of the, uh, the um, most def definite study in this area. This is 1968, Rosenthal and Jacobson released an influential study on the Pygmalion in the classroom. <coughs> Sorry. One of the first to provide overwhelming evidence that teachers' expectations can significantly affect students' achievement. The researchers gave teachers false information about the IQ results of selected students and then indicated that those students were on the brink of a rapid intellectual growth. So they just randomly picked some students and they, you know, they, they, told, they told the teachers, now you, this, you shouldn't do this, right? But they told the teachers, they said, these kids, watch out. According to the IQ test, these kids are going to blossom this year. You're going to see incredible things from these kids these years. And so the teachers are like, okay, okay, got it, yeah, sure. But they just randomly picked kids. There was no reason to think that these kids would be better than the other kids. But the teachers, because they had heard these people from Harvard or from some fancy university say this, something happened. The findings were startling. Those students whom teachers expected to perform well showed significantly higher gains in intellectual growth than their classmates at the end of the year. Many subs subsequent studies have since supported the general findings of the original 1968 study. What are we expecting? What was Elijah expecting in that desperate situation in his life, right? Was he expecting that God was going to bring good out of it? Or was he expecting more trouble? When Mary went to the tomb, her heart was broken. This is not what she was hoping for. This was, a, this was a, an amazing disappointment in her life. And when she got to the tomb, Mary saw the empty tomb as a problem. She was expecting things to continue to be like they were, expecting things to be a problem in her life. Mary saw the empty tomb as things going from bad to worse, out of the frying pan into the fire. Wasn't it bad enough that we lost Jesus on Friday and now look, we've lost his body? Sheer expectations, but Mary was wrong. The empty tomb was an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power to turn evil into good. What are we expecting in our desperate situations? And, and, and you know, it goes beyond just our relationships with one another. It goes into our relationship with God. Check this quote out. This is an incredible quote. Why is it that we do not receive more from him who is the source of light and power? We expect too little. Has God lost his love for man? Is not this love still flowing earthward? Has he lost his desire to show himself strong in behalf of his people? Even in our relationship with God, we need to be careful that we don't let our expectations go in the wrong direction. Do you think Elijah was thinking and talking about God's ability and power to handle the situation or his own inability to handle the situation as he was running away? You think he was running down the road and going, man, God's going to handle this, God's going to handle this. Or do you think he was like, I can't deal with this anymore? Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. Sometimes we are thinking about the wrong things. Sadness and talking of disagreeable things is encouraging the disagreeable scenes. That's incredible. That we can unconsciously actually be, you know, kind of nurturing that bad stuff by just continuing to think about it. Bringing back upon oneself the disagreeable effects. God wants us to forget all these, not look down, but up, up, exclamation mark. The devil is constantly insinuating, your sins are too great to be forgiven. 
You don't have enough faith to get through what you're going through right now. You are not sorry enough for your sins. You haven't repented enough. You'll never be able to make it through the end times. You are too weak. But you'll notice that in his insinuations, it's all about you, you, and you. But it's not about us. It's about God. His grace is greater than our sins. If we don't have enough faith, he will finish giving us what we need. If we don't feel sorry enough for our sins, he will change our hearts. If we don't feel like we'll make it through the tough times, it's not about our feeling, it's about his promise to keep us from falling. If we are weak, his strength will be made perfect in our weakness. It's about him, him, and him. So let's go back to Elijah. Elijah was so discouraged that he ran away from his problems in life. But every splash was a gentle reminder, Elijah, God cares about you. Every time Elijah splashed into a puddle in that land that had not seen rain for three and a half years, every time he hit the puddle, it was a reminder, Elijah, God answers prayers. What would God do? You know, during Gulf Gulf War I, the um, Iraqis were told as the Americans were headed towards them, and they were uh, obviously outnumbered, but during Gulf War I, as the Americans were headed towards the Iraqis, the Iraqis were given order. And they said, if in the middle of the war, as they see the Americans coming towards them, you see your fellow countrymen turn tail and run, you turn your rifle around and shoot them in the back and kill them. You don't run in the middle of a war. So what would God do when one of his top generals runs away in the middle of a battle? Would he shoot him in the back? A lightning bolt from the sky, you know? What was that? Well, that pile of ash, that used to be Elijah. No. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank. No, God didn't shoot him in the back. He sent an angel to make his servant breakfast. Talk about room service. After having an angel make you breakfast, Elijah certainly stopped running from his problems then, right? I mean, if you had an angel that showed up at your house tomorrow morning and says, hey, what's it going to be this morning? You want fresh canola? What would you like, you know? You know, I think I would think twice about my problems, right? So certainly after Elijah has an angel make him breakfast the next day, and, and the angel is just there, and he's like, yeah, here you go, Elijah. Certainly then Elijah stopped running from his problems. Certainly then he went back, right? Didn't he? Nope. He lay down again, went back to sleep with his problems. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Well, then he went back. I mean, after having breakfast served to you in, in bed twice by an angel, certainly then Elijah said, oh, this was stupid. I, God's here. God's with me. God's going to take care of this. I can go back. God will help me to deal with this. Certainly, after having breakfast in bed by an angel for two mornings in a row, Elijah went back, right? Nope. He got up, and he went 40 days to Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came to a cave and stayed there. What would God do now? What would he do for his despairing child? Finally, after 40 days of this guy running away from his problems, God finally gave up on him, right? He said, Elijah, I've had enough of your messing up. I give up on you, Elijah. Is that what God did? No. Elijah, are you discouraged? I'll send an angel to make you breakfast. 
Elijah, are you still discouraged? Elijah, I'll send another angel to make you brush at breakfast. Elijah, are you still discouraged, my child? I will come and be with you myself in your discouragement. God himself showed up there in the middle of that man's despair, in the middle of that man's problems, in the middle of that hopeless situation himself. God didn't send another angel. God didn't say, hey, somebody else go and talk to the man. Give him a video. Give him a Bible study. God himself came to be with his child in the middle of that desperate situation. But you know the devil couldn't sit still while the love of God is being shown like that. He couldn't just say, oh, yeah, you just go ahead and, and you, you go ahead, God, and bless him, right? The devil decepts, tries to deceive Elijah by doing what? Not showing up and saying, hey, I'm the devil, but doing an impersonation of God when he is hurting. When Elijah is hurting, he does a godlike impression. And here's the godlike impression. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain, and it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. I don't know about you, but I've never seen that. Walking out, seeing boulders flying around. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. I mean, certainly the Lord was in the fire. He had just seen fire fall down from heaven, right? God had to be in this fire, right? No, it wasn't God. It wasn't God. And the devil sometimes comes into our lives when we're hurting, when we're desperate, when life is just going bad for us, and he does his impression of God. I remember I was, I have chronic back problems, and about, uh, I don't know, many years ago, I had a, a doctor when I was living in Southern California. He says, you know what, I'm going to send you over to Loma Linda, let them work and see what's going on with you. And so they sent me over to Loma Linda, and uh, I got over to Loma Lynn, and they sent me downstairs to the basement. Now, there are things in the basement that you don't want to know about. At least I didn't want to know about. So I got downstairs, and I'm sitting in this room. I'm wondering, what are they going to do to me? And finally, they called me, and they pulled me in the room, and they said, we're going to do some tests on you. Okay, I'm thinking, all right, look, I've had this back pain for so long. Yeah, let's just do it. I'm, yeah, let's do it. They said, okay, the first test we're going to do, we're going to hook up these pads to you, and we're going to send this electricity jolting through your body. Excuse me? <laughs> you're going to do what? You know, we, we, we're going to hook these up, and we're going to test your muscles and see how they're working. And that's what they did. They put these pads on you, and then they shock you, and they watch how your muscles contract. My muscles worked great. They contracted just fine. I felt it very, very much. And then they said, okay, now the next thing we're going to do is, you know, like, uh, that wasn't enough, right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take these needles. And they were long needles. And they said, we're going to take these needles and we're going to stick them into the center of where your nerves come together. And we're going to wiggle them around and see how you do. I did very well. They stuck those things in there. I came alive. I felt it very much. And I could not believe that this was the test they were doing. I was feeling a lot worse. I was not feeling better. And finally, when it was all done, and they were done sticking the needles in me and jolting me with electricity, I was laying there going, it's worth it. It's worth it if it just can get over this back pain. And in comes the doctor, and the doctor says, we got good news. Everything's fine. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I went through all this pain, and the only thing you're going to tell me is I'm fine? I've been living with this chronic pain for years, and the only thing you can tell me is everything's working good. And I wanted to run. I wanted to scream. I wanted out of there. I was like, God, what are you doing to me? And as it would have it, the, um, the nurse came in, and she's like, I can't let you go quite yet. I'm like, please let me go. I wanted to cry. And she says, you need to come back into the waiting room. There's something wrong with your paperwork. We need to straighten it out. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. 
And as I was sitting there in the waiting room along with the other people, my thoughts were just all engulfed to myself and my pain. And I, I, there, all of a sudden, there was a movement on the, the side next to, uh, kind of across the, the, the way from me from some chairs over there. There was a mother sitting there with her daughter that was probably about 16 years old. And all of a sudden, her, her daughter just stiffened up like a board and began just shaking, violently shaking. She went into a grand mal seizure. And she slipped from the chair onto the ground. And the spirit said to me, see, it could be worse. And I thought to myself, God, that is not helping me. And then the real spirits spoke. You see, sometimes Satan tries to impersonate God. And I watched as that daughter slipped onto the floor. Her mother slipped onto the floor next to her. And her mother's on the floor in the middle of this waiting room. And the mother takes her, takes her daughter into her arms and cradles her in her lap. And her head, head is in her arms like this. And the Holy Spirit says, that's what I feel like when you go through pain. And finally, the right impression of what God is like came through to my mind. Satan does his impersonations when we're hurting. Satan tries to make us think that God is indifferent to our suffering and our pain when God is in reality hurting with us. And after that, the fire, there was a still small voice. Elijah, you're still mine. I haven't given up on you. This situation isn't as bad as it seems. I've got a plan to clean up the mess. And I believe in you and want you as my ambassador. Now let's go back to work. Maybe like Elijah, you have some threatening people or situations in your life tonight. We've learned tonight that God can handle those people. He can show us a way to deal with them. He can make a way out. Or maybe like Elijah, you've been running from some mistakes you've made in your past. Messes that you've made. We have found out tonight that God runs after us when we're running away that he still cares about us. He still believes in us. And he has a way to clean up the messes in our lives. Or perhaps tonight you can understand Elijah's discouragement. You can relate to the feelings of despair, of wanting to give up and not wanting to live, of feeling like the future is dark, that the pain will go on forever and things will never change. But we've learned tonight that is a lie. This wasn't the end for Elijah. God had big plans for his life. His life wasn't to end in failure, but in glorious triumph. Can we pray? Lord God in heaven, you know what each person is dealing with tonight. You know that the battle is raging in some hearts tonight. That it is so heavy and so difficult that it's even it feels like Satan is just sitting on their chest. It's hard to breathe. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them. I pray that you would send through that, get through that hope and that light that you would remove the misconceptions about what you are thinking and feeling about them in the midst of this struggle, that you would help them, Lord, to see that you have a good plan in this, a plan for future and for hope. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.